Father, we give thanks that you are the God of the nations, that you are the creator of the world, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, that you are the beginning and the end, the sovereign one, high and lifted up, lofty, sovereign in power and grace and in mercy, that you are a God who is good, that you are a God who knows us, you are a God who knows the frailties of the human frame, having taken that to yourself in Christ. We give thanks that even though you know us, even though you know us through and through, as the psalmist reminds us, that you have loved us with an everlasting love, that you have given your salvation to us in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that as God the Son gave his life as a ransom for many, that we might know the great and eternal hope of Jesus within our hearts and lives, not just in the mere present, but also in the future and for all eternity. Father, we give thanks this morning that as we come before you in worship and as we bow the knee, as it were, as we recognise your majesty and your splendour, as we come under the authority of your word with its uh, inspiration and its power, we pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us by it and through it. We pray that your spirit would be at work reminding us of the truth, that your spirit would be convicting us of that which is wayward within our own hearts and lives, that your spirit would be active in drawing us to the uh, immeasurable grace of the Lord Jesus that we find in him. Lord, we recognise that we stumble and we falter, that we are failures so very often, but we give thanks that Christ Jesus never stumbled, never faltered, never failed, that he was the one who upheld your law, the one who fulfilled your law, the one who uh, met your justice, the one who fulfilled all righteousness in order that we might be called sons and daughters of God, in order that we might be adopted into your family, not because we are worthy not because we are deserving, but because Christ has declared us so. And so we rejoice this morning in Jesus afresh. We thank you for the means of grace which is ours to come before you in worship. We thank you for that exhortation that we have within your word and that example set forth for us uh, through the early church, gathering together under the apostles' teaching, devoting themselves to the word of God, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, to fellowship, to sharing one with another, to gathering to becoming the church. We give thanks that this is merely a building in which the church gathers, that this building is not the church, but that we are the church, the body of Christ with Jesus as our head. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today. Father, we give thanks that you are Lord of all, that you are a sovereign over all things. And we look around the world and perhaps sometimes circumstances can lead us to question even that truth. But we know, Lord, that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you, that you are working all things together to bring about your purposes and to fulfill your plan of redemption. And so, Lord, we commend to your care those who are in dire straits in these days, those who are faced with uh, inherent difficulty within their lives, those who are living through uh, unrest, through war, through uh, intolerance and persecution. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are in Ukraine and those who are in the Middle East and those who are in other places too where there is difficulty and where there is trial and where there is hardship and where there is exploitation and abuse and sadness and soreness and heartbreak and tragedy and distress. Lord, we give thanks that your grace is sufficient for all of these things and we pray that your will would be done. So we pray that you would bless us now and go before us for we ask it in Jesus' name. We're going to read this morning from John's Gospel, returning to our series in, in John. Believe a journey through John. That was John's motive, uh, his inspiration for writing his Gospel, that people would believe. Uh, at the end of the Gospel, he notes that many other miracles were conducted by Jesus that aren't recorded within this Gospel, but these are recorded that you may believe, and that by believing, you may have life, and life in his name, life in Jesus' name. Uh, we are in verse... Uh, verses 29 to 33 of chapter 16 uh, today as we as we move through the gospel we're in the upper room discourse well they've moved on from the upper room but it's still classified as the upper room discourse Jesus is speaking privately with his disciples he's teaching them he's preparing them 
Uh, he's telling them of what is going to come. So we're going to begin our reading at verse 17 of John chapter 16, and this is the word of God. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, with one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again. You will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked me for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even uh, need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Jesus replied, the time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his own holy and inspired word to us. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains before. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me. Wow. 
sun and shield. We give thanks that you are the one who will grace and glory give, that you are the one in whom we find all things, the one in whom we are kept together, the one who is the author and sustainer of our faith, the one who is the keeper and the sustainer of the world in which we live and know. And so, Lord, we lift our eyes unto you this morning and we look to you for your help, recognising our own frailty, our own weakness, our own inability. When faced with trial and trouble, so often we are undone or we have little resource and little knowledge we lack in wisdom but we give thanks that in you and through you that we are promised uh, all that we require and so lord we pray that we might rest in you even in the failures of life even though many of us stumble and falter even though perhaps we're living through a failure of one type or another even at this very moment we give thanks that you are the one who sustains us in it and teaches us uh, through it and so we pray that you would bless us and bless your word now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it'll be uh, two and a half years next month since we began our study in the Gospel of John. Yeah, April 2022, would you believe? I'm sure you can't. It's moved so quickly. I hope, like myself, you're enjoying John's Gospel. It is so rich in theology and so full of practical teaching that it really makes the Christian faith real. As one writer said, the Gospel of John is shallow enough for a child to paddle and deep enough for an elephant to swim. Inch by inch, paragraph by paragraph, verse by word, verse, we have been digging deeply into John's Gospel. We could have gone slower, believe it or not, you're saying, please, no, no slower uh, at all. But there is just so much that we find within uh, John's Gospel. But for the sake of time, and because we'd like to finish before the Lord returns, uh, let's try and wrap up chapter 16 uh, this morning, uh, shall we, by looking at these uh, last few uh, verses. And what we have here presented before us is the theme of failure. Failure. I've already spoken to the young folk about failure and the reality of failure, the present reality of failure within our lives. It is inevitable. It's going to happen. If it hasn't happened in your life already, it's going to happen. Either that or you're lying to yourself. In life, you will have monumental failures. In life, you will have public failures. You will experience private failures. You will experience little and large failures. To live is to fail, one might say. To grow is to fail. Arguably, arguably we grow the most through our failures. It is an adversity that character is born through perseverance. And perseverance leads to character and character hope. And we know that from God's word. We all stumble and falter in many ways, John, uh, James uh, reminds us. And so we are in good company here this morning. We are all failures to one degree or another. We all struggle with different things. We all fail in different areas. But failure should never be an undertaker. It should always be an instructor. Failure should always be an instructor, never an undertaker. Uh, it should never be that we fall and we remain fallen, but that we fall and that we're able to get back up, that we would help one another, but that in the grace of God, we would be restored. Well, here the disciples of Jesus are in for a fall. Their faith is soon to be shaken to its very core. Doubt is going to assail their minds. They are going to stumble and they are going to falter. But it's not going to be a permanent failure. It's not going to be a permanent faltering. They would get up again. They would stand again. They would be strong again. If you think about life, we all start out as failures. Remember when you were, well, you probably don't, but 
when we began to learn how to walk, we didn't just get up and walk. There was a lot of stumbling and falling and crawling and bumping into things. Uh, it took time. It took many falling down in order, many falling down experiences for us to stand up and to be able to live and to walk. The first time we tried to swim, I don't think we would have managed the butterfly. Uh, we would have been more like the doggy paddle, uh, most likely. First time you tried to use a pool cue, you might not have even hit the cue ball uh, as you were trying. The first time we tried anything in life, we probably didn't ex excel at it. Failure is instructive. I'm sure those of us who are Christian believers and who profess Jesus as Lord, we have never maintained a perfect witness for Jesus, that we've failed, that we've faltered in that. We've remained quiet when we should have spoken. We've been fearful, we've been ashamed rather than bold and courageous. So the point is that we all know what failure is. The key though in failure is getting back up. I don't always appeal to the theology of Rocky Balboa, but Rocky Balboa in the Rocky film said, it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep getting up, keep moving forward. Let me tell you the story of a man who failed and who failed and who failed and who failed, but who got back up and got back up and got back up. And see if you can guess who he was as we read through uh, this list. He was a businessman, and he failed in business in 1831. He was defeated for the legislator, uh, legislature in 1832. He was elected to the legislature in 1834. His sweetheart died in 1835. He had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated for Speaker of the House in 1838. He was defeated for Congress in 1843. Eventually, he was elected to Congress in 1846, but again defeated for Congress in 1848. He was defeated for the Senate in 1850. He was defeated for the vice presidency in 1856 and for the Senate in 1858. Who was that man? Abraham Lincoln, eventually elected president of the United States of America, but not before failing and failing and failing and failing and getting back up and getting back up and getting back up. We've all failed, haven't we, in different ways and in different places. Some of us have uh, failed with some things or with someone or even with the Lord. But the truth for you today is if your hope is in Christ, if your identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can have a deep sense of peace in your life and victory over your failures. That's really what Jesus is reminding His disciples of here. That's the thrust of these closing words in John chapter 16. I have told you these things so that you may have peace, says Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. You will fail. You will falter. People will attack you. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Here we are in the upper room discourses, chapters 13 to 16 of the Gospel of John. It's the longest recorded message that Jesus gives to His disciples in Scripture. It started in the upper room with the, the Last Supper, but after the supper, uh, Jesus reveals His betrayer, who subsequently leaves. He then uh, says to His disciples at the end of chapter 14, come, let us leave. And so, they're up, they're on their feet, and they're traveling down towards the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't have a specific location for this discourse, but probably somewhere around the Kidron uh, Valley. Jesus has said a lot of things to the disciples. He's taught them many of things, most of which they haven't understood up until this moment. They've un interrupted Him a few times when He spoke of uh, messages revealing things that they, they didn't understand. But suddenly here, they seem it's a light bulb moment. They seem to get it. The lights go on. They say, oh, we now, we now believe. We now understand who you are. We get it. This is good. And as good as that sounds, immediately after they've said that, Jesus predicts that they're going to fail. <laughs> they're just getting to that point. Yes, get it. Light bulb. Got you. Jesus says, really? Really? let me tell you, you're going to fail. You're going to be scattered. But ultimately, eventually, you'll know my peace, and you'll know my security in my victory. Three, pass three uh, principles then from 
this passage by looking at the bragging of the disciples, the blundering of the disciples, and the blessing promised by Jesus. Here's the first principle. Our faith is unreliable. Our faith, our faith, is unreliable. Think about those words. See now, the, the disciples say, you are speaking plainly, and you're using no figure of speech. Now uh, we are, now we know all, all things. Um, what's, uh, you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Now we know. <laughs> now we believe. That is the assertion of the disciples uh, here. Everything up until this point has been a little bit cryptic. They haven't really been able to dial in to exactly what Jesus has been saying because he's been using figurative uh, language, and so they didn't always uh, understand. You go back to verse 16, and it says Jesus is talking about the little while, you remember, the little while, which could mean imminently, immediately, or eventually, as we looked at uh, previously. The disciples are saying to each other, what the heck is he on about? I'm paraphrasing there. That's not necessarily exactly what they said, but that was the, that was the theme. That was, the, that was their thought. What is he talking about? We don't understand this. So, Jesus then explains to them more clearly. He gives them the example of a pregnant woman giving birth, and in the birth and the arrival and the delivery of that child healthy, all of the hardship and all of the pain and all of the difficulty that has led to that point is in that moment forgotten about as she marvels at this baby that is uh, before her. And Jesus says, listen, I, I'm going to be gone. I, I'm going to be killed, uh, but I'm coming back, and, and you will see me again. Verse 25, he says, though you, I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language. I came from the Father, in verse 28, he says, and entered the world, and now I'm leaving. I'm going back to the Father. It's plain and it's simple. Now we get it. Now we understand, now we see where you are coming from. So they make this bold statement of belief because Jesus has revealed this to them. It, just as an, an, an aside, in, in verse 17, if you look at it, uh, it says, At this, some of the disciples said to one another. They didn't say to Jesus, What are you on about? They didn't say to Jesus, What, what are you talking about this? little by little, this, this little while. No, they only said it to one another. They didn't say it uh, to Jesus. They said it to one another. But then in verse 19, Jesus knew, or Jesus saw in the NIV here, knew is probably a better translation. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask Him about this. Why? Well, He's the omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing Son of God. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew what was in their minds, just like He knows what's in your heart and what's in my mind. Uh, and so, He speaks to them about that. He explains it to them more uh, clearly. So, they're thinking in their mind, hang on a minute, we never said to Jesus that we were talking about this. We never mentioned this to Jesus, but here He is. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows what we're thinking. Surely, He is the one who He said He was. Now, we can see that you are you don't even need us to ask you questions, and you can answer the questions for us. We believe. We, we know. Immediately, Jesus says, well, actually, you're going to be scattered. You're going to be confused. You're, you're going to be scattered. On this night, though it's not recorded here, there are some other bold assertions of faith, aren't there, in other Gospels? If you, if you go to, to Matthew, you can find the assertion that comes from Peter. You remember that assertion? Jesus says, I want you to, he, he says to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to know that even though everybody else might forsake you, even though everybody else, you know, the other disciples, Jesus, a wee bit flaky, you know, but I'm Peter, you've, you've given me the name of the rock, I'm, I'm, I'm solid, I'm not ever going to let you down. Jesus says, well, actually, Peter, before the morning comes, before the cock crows, you're going to disown me three times. What does Peter say? Even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. What does Peter do? He denies Jesus three times before the cock crows. Sometimes our assertions of faith can be unreliable. Why? Because often they're based on ourselves and our understanding and our thoughts 
and not necessarily on objective, verifiable, biblical truth. They say, we believe, but their belief is actually attached to an unrealistic expectation. What is that unrealistic expectation? Jesus is telling them, listen, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. And they're saying, no, we believe he's going to set up his messianic kingdom immediately. They're not thinking he's going to die and he's going to disappear for 2,000 plus years. That's not on their radar screen. Even after he, he rises from the dead, you remember in Acts chapter 1, what did he say? Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? That's what they're anticipating. That's what they've been looking for. That's what they've been longing for, this, this, political, this, messa- this political messiah, this messianic king who would come and who would establish himself in a political rule. That's what they believed earnestly, but it was wrong. Let's apply this to ourselves then. We say that we believe in God. Great thing. We say that we know certain fixed theological truths. Good. It's good to be informed. It's good to inform our minds. But we have to be careful, don't we, about what it is that we're putting our trust and our hope and our belief belief in. Is it verifiably, biblically accurate? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We've all spoken presumptuously in our lives. Of course we have. Pride goes before a fall, as the writer to the Proverbs say, uh, the writer of Proverbs says, in their hearts, as we looked at with the young folk, humans plan their course, man plans his course, but the Lord establishes their steps. If we just believe by attending a church that, that we'll be okay, then we're mistaken. If we think that just by saying Jesus is Lord, we'll be okay, then we're mistaken. What does Jesus say? There will, many, there will be many on that day who say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, away from me, for I never knew you. Uh, if our belief is that by saying these things, then we will be healthy, wealthy, and wise, then we're mistaken, as we've looked at. Because throughout Scripture, again and again, we are we are ushered into the the reality of difficulty, of hardship, of trial. What's promised is not necessarily health, wealth, and wisdom. (laughs) What is promised is hardship. What is promised is probable failure. What is promised is trouble. As we've said before, rose garden theology is not real theology. The prosperity gospel is not the gospel. So then we have to consider, what is it? What actually is it that I believe? Do I believe Jesus? Do I believe in what Jesus said? Do I believe in the promises that Jesus made? Or am I only selective, picking the ones that suit me, like a spiritual kind of pick and mix? Those who are acceptable to uh, my, my set of ideals, my, my desires for life. If that's the case, then when our expectations are not met, what happens? We fall away because of disappointment. We turn and we walk. We're scattered because life has not panned out in the way that we hoped that it might. They're saying, oh, we believe. Jesus is saying, do you? truth is, you're going to be scattered. truth is, it's not all going to be good. So, our faith is unreliable. Our faith is unreliable. The one in whom we put our faith is absolutely reliable. That's why the object of our faith is so important. We all have faith. You have faith that the chair that you're sitting in just now is going to keep you up, and it's not going to fall to the ground. Not the same when you're sitting on a plastic holiday chair, not for people like me anyway. We all have faith. We have faith in ordinary things. Faith that, uh, that we're going to be able to walk out this building when the service is finished. Faith that uh, there's going to be food in the, in, the, in the fridge when we go home. Faith that the car will start as we go out from the building. Faith in a great many things, but what do we have faith in for our eternal future? See, what we have faith in is irrelevant in, in some respects. What I believe is irrelevant in some, respect, some respects, but the thing that I put my faith in the person that I put my faith in, that is all important. Our faith can be unreliable. 
Secondly, our failures are understandable. Failure is understandable. A time is coming, says Jesus, and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. These disciples, they think the fog is lifting. They think they're seeing uh, clearly. Things have been hazy and opaque and, and uncertain. The fog is lifting, and immediately Jesus says, aha, but a storm's coming. Mm. Things aren't just going to be as straightforward as maybe you had hoped they would be. You're going to flee. You're going to run away. You're going to be scattered. That instinct of self-preservation is going to kick in. Now, two things are implied here, briefly. Number one, you, my disciples, he says, are going to be very confused. That's implied here in the question of verse 31. They say, we believe. Jesus says, do you believe? Do you? Because in a couple of hours, they're going to doubt again. Because in a few hours, Jesus is going to be on a cross. In a day's time, He's going to be dead and in the tomb. And those doubts are going to take over. Fast forward on the road to Emmaus. You remember the experience of the men on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection of Jesus? They're walking along. They don't know that Jesus has risen from the dead. Remember the story? Jesus comes uh, to them incognito. They don't, he, he stops them from recognizing who he is. He comes up and says, hey, what, you know, what's happening, guys? Paraphrasing again. Uh, but they kind of say to him, what do you mean? Are you, are you a stranger from around here? Do you not know what's been happening the past couple of days? This cataclysmic event that has taken place, this Jesus, the one who had done all these things, the one who we had hoped was going to be the one to redeem Israel, he's dead. He's gone, crucified, he's in the tomb. Have you not heard that? That's the words that they use, Luke 24, 21. But we had hoped, past tense, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Not that we're hoping any moment that he's going he's gonna to appear and that he's, he's, he's living. No, it was over for them. They were hopeless. Their hope died when Jesus died, when the tomb was sealed, when the stone was rolled in. Their hopes, gone. We had hoped that he would be the one. We believe. Do you really believe? Do you believe whilst I'm standing in front of you and while things are good? What about when the hardship comes? What about when I'm taken away? In a few hours, they would be utterly confused, doubtful, fearful, scared. Perhaps you can identify. At one time, everything was clear for you. You knew your theology. You you understood the truth that was laid out before you. You could go to bed with a clear heart and a clear mind every night, but something happened along the way. Things are not as clear anymore. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're questioning your faith. Maybe you're questioning the Lord. Maybe you're questioning everything. Well, the advice is hold fast. Hang on. Weather the storm because the Lord is in that with you and is using that for you to bring clarity at the other side. We were in uh, Menorca on holiday uh, this week, and at one point we went to the highest point of the island, El Toro, where there's this uh, church, uh, uh, and as we were there, the weather came in, and there was this rain shower. It was really heavy when we got there, muggy. You could almost see the the rain coming. There was a heaviness to the atmosphere, and then the heavens opened, literally, and it was rain like you'd never seen. But when that rain had passed, it lifted the atmosphere. There was clarity. You could then see that which we could not see upon arrival. The heaviness was gone. The clarity came. The view was extended. That's often what happens through the storms of our lives is that we can, feel, uh, we can feel restricted by the burden of them and the darkness of them, and we can't see through them. But when they pass, we can see like we've never seen before. That's what it's like after one of these trials. The second thing that Jesus predicts here is that they're going to be scattered. Indeed, the hour is coming and, and, and has now come that you will be scattered. Scorpizo is the Greek word that's used here. It's, it's to convey the picture of sheep 
running away, dispersing in all directions. If you've ever been gathering sheep, I'm sure you can attest to that. If you didn't have your dog, you'd be wondering, how on earth could I gather these sheep as they all go off in different directions? A picture of the disciples here taking off, hightailing it off in different directions. Right now they're together. Right now they're enjoying togetherness. Right now they're enjoying this wonderful fellowship with the Lord. But as soon as the soldiers come to the Garden of Gethsemane, what happens? They're gone. Bolt, they bail, all dispersing in different directions. It's fulfilling Scripture, isn't it? The prophet Zechariah, both Matthew and Mark attest to that, Matthew 26. But Jesus, Jesus said, but all this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And you will leave me alone, he says here, predicting what is going to come to pass in the garden of Gethsemane. You will leave me alone. You're going to leave me alone. You're going to scatter in all directions. What then of their love for Him? What then of their belief in Him? What then of their commitment to Him? What then of their knowledge of Him? So often we can be like the disciples. Like Peter, I will never deny you. I will never turn away. And yet, has that not come to pass? Jesus knew that they would fail Him. Jesus knows everything. You know, they've said it themselves. We, we see that you don't even have to be asked a question. You know everything. Jesus says, yeah, I do, and you're going you're gonna to scatter. I'm, I'm on a mission. I, I know what's happening. I know what's going to come. I know that you're going to run away, but I also know that you'll be recovered. I also know that you'll know peace. I also know that you'll experience my victory. If you're in a trial, don't run away from the Lord and from His people. Don't go out on your own. So many people do that. When they start to struggle spiritually, remove themselves. Depart from the fellowship of the church. Depart from fellow Christians. Depart from the presence of the Lord. As we sang in 139, from, from where can we go to, to hide from the Lord? There is nowhere that we can go. To the heights or to the depths, the Lord is there with us run to the fellowship of the church, run to the fellowship of the saints, run to the body of Christ, run to the Lord. If we're in battle, think of a, a soldier in a fierce battle. If he runs out on his own and away, he's either captured or killed. He's vulnerable. He's not safe. But if he's with the battalion, if he's with his brothers, he is experiencing the safety and the care and the keeping of those around about him. So it is with our faith. If we're struggling, if we're failing, where's the best place we could be? Surely amongst the Lord's people. Our faith is unreliable. Our failure is understandable, but our future, thirdly, is unmistakable. Unmistakable. After the bragging and after the blundering comes the blessing, the blessing of Jesus. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's one of my favorite verses. I know you're thinking, yeah, we know. Often refer to that. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This is Jesus wrapping up the upper room discourse. This is the final word. After all that He said in these four chapters, He leaves them with this phrase, after predicting their failure, He now bathes them in this promise that their faith may be well said or well-meaning, but boasting of it didn't make any difference to the fact that they were going to fail and that they were going to leave Him alone and that they were going to be scattered, but He's telling them these things so that they may have peace and no victory, even in the hardship of life and the difficulty of the world in which they live. Jesus has said many things to the disciples throughout the upper room discourse. He's told them how much He loves them. He's shown them how much He loves them in verse 13, by in chapter 13, by washing their feet. In chapter 14, He's told them about heaven and His Father's house and the place that He is preparing for them and the peace that He is giving uh, to them, that He's going to take them with Him to be 
where he is. He's told them about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the one who will come and who will give us the truth and who will lead us in the truth and remind us of the truth and convict us of our sins and keep us and encourage us. And then he's told them how to speak to the Lord, how to pray and how to pray in, in His name and how to pray directly uh, to the Lord. That's all of these things. I have told you these things, says Jesus here as He concludes this discourse. And so, this is the bottom line. Despite all the hostility, despite the persecution, despite the tribulation that's in the world, despite of all the hardship and trial that are about to walk out into, there is the great promise of victory in Christ, the great promise of Jesus overcoming, the great promise of Jesus' peace within their hearts. People often refer to peace as an absence of conflict. If you said to, to somebody, define peace, they might say, well, it's the absence of conflict. But that's not really what peace is. It's an inadequate definition of peace. It's not the absence of conflict, is it? Peace is the presence of God even in the midst of conflict. That's true peace. That's true peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Look, guys, hardship is coming. Trial is coming. Difficulty is coming. But I'm with you, and you'll be with me. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have hardship, but take heart, because if you're with me, you've got nothing to fear. If your faith is in me, then you have nothing to fear. Uh, there's a painting in a museum called Peace. That's what it's called. And you look at it, and you think, well, where's the peace in this image? It's an image of a storm. It's an image of a storm with the sea, with waves crashing uh, onto the shore. There's lightning. It's a, it's a really wild sort of scene that's in this painting, and yet its name is, its, its tag is, is peace. There's spray all over the place. It's a really stormy, violent-looking scene, and yet as you look closely, what you find is halfway up the cliff, there's this little hole in the rock, and there's a bird with its mother there, and all the little birds are sleeping in the nest. They are asleep because she's at watch. That's why it's called peace. The reason they're sleeping is because the mother is there, and so they feel at ease, they feel at peace. Even though with all the stuff that's going on around about them, the crashing waves, the howling wind, the spray splattering uh, up the rock, they are sleeping peacefully because mother is there and mother is at watch. That's the picture here that Jesus is giving to His disciples. There will be hardship and spray and lightning and thunder and wind and waves and fearful things. But if you're in me, you can sleep peacefully because I've overcome. I am over all things. I have overcome the world. I have overcome Satan. I have overcome each and every thing. Our faith is unreliable. Our failure is understandable, but our future is unmistakable if we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you in Jesus this morning? If you're in Christ, then you have nothing to fear, regardless of what comes to pass. Some of you are in the church, but you're not in Christ. Some of you are in the building this morning, but you're not in Christ. Some of you are in the denomination. Oh, I've been free church all my life, but if you're not in Christ, then you can't know His peace. Are you in Christ? If you're in Christ, then even in your failure, you will know a future that is unmistakable. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the great hope that we find in and through Jesus. We thank You for these words and for that reminder that we are fallible, that each of us are prone to sin, as uh, prone to wander, as the hymn writer puts it, prone to leave the Lord we love, prone to do things that are foolish and unwise, such as the nature of the human heart. And yet, Lord, we thank you for the great hope that's found in Jesus. We pray for each and every one here today that we might turn to you, that you may be the object of our faith, our hope, that you may be the one in whom we believe, the things that you have said, the promises that you have made. 
and that we would rejoice in you even in the midst of trial and tribulation that we might know the peace of God which passes all understanding. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love, unrighteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, hid in the death of Christ I lay. Christ, I'll stand.